Hello, heroes. Welcome to the first episode of Character Evolution Cast. Like we mentioned last week, this will be a monthly series between each game that we cover that dives into player advice. There's so much advice out there for GMs, but being a player takes a lot of effort too. We have a variety of topics that we want to cover, each centered around helping you play the great characters that you've made, each with a guest who is an expert on the subject that we want to cover. We really hope that you enjoy this episode, and we would really love to hear your thoughts about it. Speaking of that, we are going to take a minute to read another review. This one is titled, So Many Characters, So Little Time, by BomberKid90 from the U.S. Really digging everything so far. Learning about other systems has been a treat as well. Short and sweet. Thank you so much, BomberKid90. Thank you. And speaking of reviews, we only have three more reviews left as of the time of this recording. So please, if you can take a moment, help us out a bit, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, it would help out tremendously. Plus, we really love reading them, both to ourselves and to all of you. Yeah, we keep saying that, but we we really do love it. We do. With all of that out of the way, let's get to the episode. to Character Evolution Cast, a show where we discuss what to do with all those characters we just made. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and today my co-host Ryan and I are joined by James D'Amato, host of the One Shot Podcast, to discuss using voices to embody your characters at the table. James, welcome to Character Evolution Cast. Well, hello, heroes. Thank you guys so much for having me on the show. I'm very excited about this. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And this is, uh, is this the first episode of Character Evolution? Yes. Yes. Ooh, I'm so honored. We're really excited about it. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, James, and some of the cool stuff that you're involved in? Uh, Sure. Uh, You might know me best from my role on the One Shot Podcast Network. I host the One Shot Podcast, where we get actors, comedians, and improvisers, and game designers to play a variety of different role-playing games. Every month, we have a new cast of players featuring a new role-playing system, and we just sort of tour uh, the possibilities that are out there in the world of RPGs there. Um, There are also other fantastic shows on the network that I help run. If you like interviews, if you like actual play, we've got what you're looking for over at oneshotpodcast.com. I'm also a game designer, uh, and my most recent game that's going to be kickstarting relatively soon is the Dungeon Dome card game. Oh, nice. Which is a game that combines uh, Dungeons and Dragons and pro wrestling. It's a competitive card game uh, that's almost like a mix between Magic the Gathering and Smash Up. Oh, wow. Uh, So it plays a lot faster than Magic, uh, and it's got some goofy D&D themes to it. Uh, If you want to check it out or get updates on it, uh, you can go to paracosmpress.com and read the write-up we have about it. And to join our mailing list, you can go to bit.ly slash Dungeon Dome. Dungeon Dome is all lowercase in that. And you can sign up for the mailing list and find out uh, as soon as the Kickstarter goes live. Oh, that's very cool. I got to try it out at a catacomb. It was a lot of fun. Oh. I've watched a couple of the Twitch streams that you guys have done of it now, too. It's, it looks awesome. Yeah, I'm not, super excited about it. Not much has changed since you played it. It's mostly just been numbers tweaking and like finishing like the different attacks that everybody has. But yeah, it's, it's ready to go, and I'm ready to share it with people. I know, and the art looks really good, too, with a little bit of preview stuff that you showed i'm I'm so excited we've about got it. we've got will kirkby <laughs> on the art and if you you've probably seen will's stuff somewhere on the internet he's incredible he does a lot of really cool fan art for stuff that's on the one shot network he's done some great pieces for campaign he does a lot of stuff for uh, critical role too so if you like if you like fantasy art you got to check out will yeah it's super detailed and i know he did um the logo i think for neo scum too didn't he yeah he did the logo for neo scum he did all the character the official quote-unquote character portraits for neo scum uh will's just a great dude and his art is going to look amazing in this game yeah very cool so if nothing else it's worth it just for that i think i mean the game's good too <laughs> the game i mean not to belittle good. your work too but also hey, beautiful pictures look i know i'm riding the coattails of a star and that's will so <laughs> Well, James, one of our goals with Character Creation Cast, aside from um, making amazing people, is to introduce our audience to a variety of different role 
role-playing games and people that are doing amazing things in the RPG world. Um, and I think we would be remiss if we didn't do that here as well. So we're going to start by getting to know you a little bit. Okay. Normally, we start by asking people how they got into role-playing games, but I think that's a question that you've probably answered millions of times before on various <laughs> podcasts. I, I have been on a few interview programs yes. at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask you instead why you decided to start sharing that hobby through podcasting. It's a bit of a winding road. I got into RPGs in college, and I've always loved them, and I think it's a very similar discipline to improv. There are a lot of improv skills skills that translate directly to role-playing games. Uh, and I came out here to Chicago to study improv with Second City and IO uh, and a lot of the other theaters out here. Um, so improv is something that I had like a very academic and like career focused interest for a really long nice. time. And it, you know, s absorbs your life. It's like going to grad school when, when you're doing improv, it's just a different discipline. And once I finished training, I found the most practical application of the improv skills that I picked up was actually podcasting. And so I had a comedy podcast for a long time, and I joined up with a network that's uh, sadly now defunct called Peaches and Hot Sauce, and they had a variety of comedy programs. And uh, the Overshare, my first podcast, was just one of them on that network. And the person who ran the network, Pat O'Rourke, uh, who folks now know from Neon Rivals and his work with like, he's, he's in with the God's Fall crew and all of them. He came to me and he's a huge fan of the Earwolf Network. And he was listening to Nerd Poker, which is a D&D &D focused podcast, like one of the first big ones by Brian Posehn. And he was like, hey, I, I really like the show and I know you're into RPGs. Could you do something like that for Peaches and Hot Sauce? So. I was like, well, yeah, I mean, this combines two things that I love. It's like all of the comedy stuff, all the improv stuff, and now we're getting into role-playing games. <laughs> so I, I checked out what was out there at the time mm -hmm. uh, that One Shot started up, and it was mostly D&D &D and Pathfinder games. And yeah. like a lot of people were going through uh, Rise of the Rune Lords campaign. Like you could find five different shows between YouTube and podcasts that were all about Rise of the Rune Lords, and everybody else was like, doing D&D D 3.5, a couple shows doing D&D &D 4th. And I was like, well, I love d and I truly, truly do. But I, you know, when I went to school, I, there were a bunch of other games that were not D&D &D that also had a lot of good merit. So I decided what I wanted out of my show was to show off the diverse world of RPGs mm -hmm. and, and that it's more than D&D &D and that some games like are still role playing games, but look nothing and feel nothing like that. And I got to say, I, I was I had a little bit of hubris because I had played probably like 11 games at that time. <laughs> and I was like, I'm pretty well read. I was not. <laughs> and through one shot, like I kind of discovered that, wow, it is so much more diverse and, and so much more uh, inventive and interesting than even I initially imagined. That's the basic story is somebody asked me to. Um, <laughs> but through that, I discovered a, a much deeper love and appreciation for RPGs and what they can be, which is why I'm excited to talk to folks like you, who, who it's your mission to like show them off to people and oh, help yeah. people uh, gain a deeper appreciation. Well, I'm glad that you did, because that's part of what got me back into role playing. I had played a little bit in high school and then took a while off in college because I didn't have a regular group mm -hmm. and then um, got married and had kids and all that kind of stuff and then started listening to One Shot at one point and was like I really want to play RPGs again I miss doing this oh, I'm so happy to hear that yeah so like that's what I mean I would not be doing this right now if it weren't for <laughs> One Shot so I'm really glad that Pat reached out and that you were like, yeah, I can do this. This yeah, is great. I exactly. Mean <laughs> I, 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 I am so happy too. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear that because like th that's one of the big missions over at One Shot is we want to make it more accessible to people. And that's whether you've played and haven't played in a while or you've never played before. I want the hobby to be easy to pick up because I got super invested in it and I didn't discover it until I was in college. So like right. that's a long time of my life without this thing that is pretty important to me uh, and has oh, been yeah. pretty like fundamental to my development as a person. So I, I want people to be able to approach that because I think it is good and useful and, and fun. And I, I think One Shot does a really nice job, like you said, of showing off the 
depth and breadth of different games out there too because i think a lot of people start with D &D. it's the it's the gateway drug of role-playing yeah. games <laughs> but there's so many other things and i think that there's a tendency for some people too to say oh D, &D isn't really for me mm -hmm. and that that's fine we can find something else like yeah. there's there's plenty of other options like that doesn't have to be it i think it's where a lot of people start but yeah and it's it's, it's what a lot of people it's the only household name so it's like if you don't grok D, D. if you don't like D, D, it's easy to get turned away at the door but you know like you compare that to fiasco which is a totally different experience <laughs> there's so many people i know that love fiasco but never would be able to pick up D, D at all so i'm super super glad that it's it's now easier for people to get their hands on that thing and like especially in media spaces like this like you guys started a podcast and you know, from episode like three on or so, it's a completely different game that you're showing off. And that's really cool. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I love being part of this like nerd media space. <laughs> I know, it's, it's so much fun. There's so many cool people and so many cool things. And yeah. like, ugh. and not enough time to cover everything. <laughs> yeah, well, we said it's like we can only do one game a month. So 12 games a year, like we'll be here forever. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a bad problem to have. So. No, there are, there are worse <laughs> problems in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We know that you GM quite a bit on one shot, but could you tell us about one of your favorite characters that you've ever made? Oh boy. I mean, it's most uh, characters that I made that are my favorite that have had the biggest emotional impact on me are matters of public record these days. Like uh, it's pretty easy for me to say Bacta, the character that I play on campaign. Bacta at this point is the character that I've played longer than any other. And I have a pretty deep emotional investment in that character. And I think for me, I click with the character more when I have a good emotional like relationship and when mm -hmm. when I can experience a good amount of bleed with it. Um, and, and Bacta is most certainly that. Um, I'm, I'm feeling a lot of emotions for him and I love him. He, for those who don't know Campaign, he is a clone trooper in the Star Wars universe. Uh, this is post Order 66 and instead of carrying out his order, he resisted his programming and, and tried to save the the Jedi that he was traveling with, that oh, he nice. had fallen in love with um, oh. over his years of service. He unfortunately was not able to do that and sort of was left like wandering the galaxy uh, searching for something to do when he happened along a couple other rogues and scoundrels that people know as Tristan Lenick in the campaign podcast. And he fell in with uh, some with a refugee from Dathomir who was trying to hide her son from her culture and like the empire. Oh. And he ended up raising that kid with uh, with his friends and uh, the people who became his family. So Bacta, who started it out as like this very military focused character and had like a big vengeance plot line all that sort of fell away very quickly and the most important thing to him became his relationship with this kid and and raising this child and that's that's just been a really special experience for me and like pretty much none of that is reflected on that character sheet <laughs> and it's kind of far from what that original character concept was but it's something that really developed i think by session four of playing that character, like I knew who he was and I knew what was important to him, what he was after. And I think that's one of the magical things about uh, creating a character and whatnot. Like all of the framework for Bacta is reflected on that sheet, like yeah. his, his, his military background and uh, his abilities and whatnot. But the things that became important all developed through play, which mm -hmm. is one of the things that I like about you guys calling this show character evolution, because that's very much what I feel happens uh, oh, yeah, in, the, in the process of creating and playing a character. Yeah, we get really excited about making characters and getting to come up with backstories and kind of picking all the mechanics and that kind of stuff. But we really wanted an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper because I think especially when you play a character over a long campaign like you have in campaign, um, <laughs> you get to know them a little bit better. And the way that a character changes over the arc of that story is always fascinating to me. Like they're so different even between like session one and session four. Absolutely. Um, I recently went back and listened to some of the beginning episodes of campaign too. And it's really interesting to listen to how different you guys are like by episode, what is it like 97 or uh, 96, something I think like we're that on right now. Yeah. 96 um, or 97. And uh, they're so different. And, it is but it all different. felt really organic. Cause it, I mean, it obviously happened over the course of a long period of time. Like none of it feels unwarranted in any way, but it's just, it's crazy because they develop like real people do it's always fun to kind of play that out in like a, a safe 
environment to just see how people change over time mm-hmm. as you play them out. There, there's an old uh, military saying, uh, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Uh, and I very much feel that for a character creation. No character really survives contact with the game because... <laughs> A lot of the character creation process, especially for really crunchy games where it's it's elaborate, like like your your D and D three point fives, your shadow runs, where there's a lot of moving pieces, you have this personal play in your head. Um, personal play is a term that I use for aspects of role playing that don't in- directly involve other people. And forming your game world or forming your character is an aspect of personal play. It's something that you do alone uh, in a vacuum and that has the potential to change a lot by the time you actually sit down at the table or by session two or three where you've inhabited that character's body and voice for a while. Like th- these personal play processes, I I don't think like like it's it's such a huge part of play, but it's never something that you really get to see at the table because like, you know, listening to your show, it's like, oh, you've got all of these rad concepts and whatnot. But when you actually sit down to play, you're going to find that two or three aspects of mm-hmm. that you know, yeah. multifaceted character are really going to shine through. And that's going to be what develops over the course of the game. Mm-hmm. I recently got to sit down with the cast for Shadow of the Cabal and, and talk about their first season. We did a big like five hours of um, <laughs> like postmortem question and answer at the end of their campaign. And that was one of the questions I asked was what things that you had laid out at the beginning actually mattered at the end and it was like most of them did not you know it was like we had all these ideas for my character and then by the end you know none of that really ended up being what was important because a lot of the things that change your character and make your character who they are are things that come up in play yeah. and so as much fun as it is to create characters and write a backstory and sometimes those they can kind of color their motivations for doing things. A lot of times they aren't necessarily the formative experiences that you think that they'll be. And I never want to discredit that process either. I I have a huge amount of reverence for personal play. And I I think character creation is a really appealing part of the process. And for some people, it's their literal favorite thing is Mm -hmm. my buddy, Alan Linick, (laughs) who plays on a woman with hollow eyes in his regular D and D game that he plays in, he has, has gone through like five characters in the past year. And like, he'll be a character, he'll create a new one, and then he'll be creating another one off to the side that'll get it more excited about. And his first character will like die or retire or whatever. So he can bring the new one in. And that, character creation process of like inventing a new person and then bringing them into a story that that is so gratifying and so cool Mm -hmm. um but it's just i think it goes to show how multifaceted role-playing is and then how it changes when when you actually get to sit down at the table i think it's so cool yeah there's so many moving parts of it that are really exciting and i wish that we could do a podcast about all of them like i wish that you could have like this one about characters and then this one about playing the characters and then this one about you know what to do when you're done with those characters and you feel sad um like we need like character Ooh, therapy cast man that's i ugh, i know i have a no, lot of you're ideas just throwing out some really really good ideas so you know maybe that'll be down the line sometime. right yeah. yeah i don't know what we'll call that one but Next year. we'll get to it <laughs> when we're done with the six years of content we already have planned <laughs> So if you have to give someone one reason to try out role-playing games, what is the one reason that you give them? Boy, yeah, (laughs) that's so hard. (laughs) And I I think the most obvious reason is that you're probably going to have fun with it. There is a chance that you will have more fun doing this than almost anything you've ever done in your entire life. That that is my feeling on role playing games. Like I was into acting and improv in high school, but like when I sat down and played my first role playing game, like I realized how much creative joy I got out of the whole process, out of making a character, out of portraying that character and and doing it from my own script and thinking about where that character might end up and how I might get them there. I fell in love with it completely. And that's only one way that you love this thing. Like there are so many, some people love D&D because they are huge fans of the rules and they like to know those rules and systems. Oh yeah, That's so wild to me. Like I can't imagine (laughs) engaging that way, but people do. And it's like the most important thing to them. People are working jobs, spending a huge portion of their lives so that they can support this hobby. So you know, try it out. Try it out because 
I, I never thought I would be a role playing game person. Like I heard about Dungeons and Dragons in high school, and I thought that's too nerdy for me, the <laughs> giant nerd. But like when I actually got to play it, you know, it, it, it changed my life like pretty fundamentally. And like th- there was a long period of years where I wasn't playing games as much, and it's really hard to think about that time now, especially with it becoming my career and stuff. It's so so important to me. So the big reason. You'll probably have fun with it. So give it a shot. I There's something, there's a little bit of something for everybody there. I think, yeah. you know, if you really love math, there are plenty of games where you can, you know, calculate all of the, yeah, the simulationist you know, all of the angles and the style. Right. Yeah. And I know when I, I've been trying to get my sister to play with me too. Um, and she's very much into creative writing and that kind of stuff and was very interested in the aspect of being able to tell a story. And I, I think that's a, a solid way to sell it to people too, who mm-hmm. like that creative aspect. And for me, that's, I like the collaborative part of it. I like to tell stories with other people. Mm-hmm. I'm not good at writing them on my own. Like I sit down and I'm like, okay, now I'm stuck, but I like being able to like work off of other people. Yeah. There's cooperative world building, there's storytelling, there's math, there's problem solving. There's any number of things that you mm-hmm. can get out of it, I think. Yeah. And if you want to play it as a pure miniatures game, war games and stuff like that are hugely popular. But you can play D&D that way, too, if you really wanted to. Just go from battle to battle. Yep. I mean, in fourth edition, like, that was a big mm-hmm. selling point for it is that it was this uh, sort of more tactical, combat-focused take mm-hmm. on, on D&D. And, like, that's always been part of the DNA. And because D&D is sort of the, like, D&D is the ancestor system to almost all role-playing games <laughs> um, of, of all RPGs. Like, wargaming is sort of baked in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, it didn't really separate out until, like, late 90s design stuff. Um, so it, it, it's really, really cool all that can be there for you in role-playing games. Mm-hmm. And I, I just think there's almost something for everyone. Well, and I think that goes back to trying out lots of dis- different systems, too, because, you know, D&D might not be for you, but I think, you know, you can find something in pretty much any game Yeah. if mm-hmm. you, you know, if you're willing to look a little bit and try out some things that are a little bit different. Yeah, and I understand that that's a big ask for certain people, but, like, you know, that's why shows like this exist, so that you can sort of get an idea. Right, mm-hmm. yeah, stuff. I mean, it's okay, like, shout into the void, and somebody will answer back and say, here, I have a suggestion for mm-hmm. you. Um, <laughs> the void will answer. <laughs> so, no, but there are plenty of options, and I think that, you know, you can always always ask, and I'm sure there are plenty of people who are willing to make suggestions for you, too. <laughs> so, uh, we know that you also do game design as mm-hmm. well. What made you want to try your hand at game design? So I I think you can only be in a sort of diversity of like options focused role playing world so long before you get a bit of a design bug. For me, I think, God, it was just like a couple months into doing one shot that I sort of had the second epiphany on how wild and diverse role playing games can really be that made me go, man, I want to see more innovation in this field, even if that means making my own innovations to Mm -hmm. do it. So like I started working on the first design that that is n- never really made it public facing uh, that I collaborated on with with uh, Kat Epiphany like I, I'd just say just a couple months into doing one shot and it's just the sort of thing where I was so amazed by games that I just wanted to join that conversation and also role playing games I think more so than a lot of other things out there it is easier I think to conceive of creating one of those things like once you've played a couple games you go oh there are these pre-existing frameworks and structures that that I can understand and manipulate to make my own thing and it's just a written thing like you can do a microsystem that's all fits on one page with Mm -hmm. really just a couple of options and you can if you really work at it you can finish one of those in a day. In, in my mind, it, it, it's something because it's so possible and so inspiring, like I, I think it's easy to fall into that design trap. And that's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> and I think what really, really made me want to go for it more so than, you know, even my original like drafts and dabbles that I did with it was attending Metatopia for the first mm. time and being surrounded by that brilliant creative energy of everybody who's there and like working on not only their own games, but like collaborating on other people's games and, and lending their wisdom and whatnot going to Metatopia once. Like I have seen so few people who go to Metatopia and 
don't bring a design the year after they go the first time. <laughs> this is such a small community, but that also means the separation between you and like the creators that, that you really admire and love, that there's almost no separation. Like mm -hmm. you can you can tweet them and have a conversation with them pretty easily, which I think makes uh, the accessibility to role playing design like, you know, really easy and there. Yeah, I think that that's one thing that I've learned through doing this podcast, too, is that um, it's really actually not that hard to get in touch with people that make things. And it turns out that most of the people that you know that play games are also also designers in their own way, whether it's hacking a game that they've, they really like to do something a little bit different or making their own game to like having a fully published version of a game. Mm -hmm. um, there's really not a lot of separation because I think you, you start playing a game, you're like, wouldn't it be cool if it did this? And then you kind of start messing around with that and then you're like well no I'll just start over with this other thing over here yeah. and it, I, it's it seems to snowball really quickly <laughs> and it's, it's, it's really important to me that that we keep that like playing field like ground and level and, and say that I truly honestly believe that just GMing a game is an act of design at, at mm -hmm. a certain point you actively decide oh well you know we're probably not going to deal with encumbrance rules there, there are encumbrance rules in D and D, and just deciding, well, I don't care about that, or deciding, oh, we're going to do event-based XP. That's an act of design. You've decided something about the experience that you mm -hmm. want for your game, and altered or decided to tap different versions of the rules in order to create it. Like going back to character creation, your stat generation, whether you're rolling using point by or picking an array, mm -hmm. as the game master, when you tell people to do one of those three things, you've made a design choice. If you've decided on arrays, uh, you've decided, well, I want everybody to have pretty much the same tools to start with. If you decided on point by, you're like, I want some customization. And if you decided on rolling, you're like, nah, let's see what random chance does to mm -hmm. it. That's an act of design, friend. And the only difference uh, between what you do there and what uh, most people think of like a more official published designer does is that they put their work out there. Yeah. And like they went through uh, the work to like print it in a book, mm -hmm. but that doesn't make it more legitimate than what you're doing in terms of design. And these days, publishing is really easy. Like you can share a Google Doc and like <laughs> that's publishing. Um, so I, I, if you have had a thought about how to change a game, I think you are a designer. Mm -hmm. If you've written it down, you know, you have become like a, a written designer. If you've shared it, that's published. And that low separation, I think, is something that really drives the innovation in this field. And, and one of the things that makes me love the hobby so much. Nice. I think that's a really cool point, though, because there are very, very few tables out there that don't have some kind of house rule in place. Yeah. Almost none of us. I mean, mm -hmm. there, again, there are people that like to play rules as written, um, and that's that's fine if that's what's fun for you. <laughs> um, but there are very few tables that do that all the way through. And mm -hmm. so I think that's a really good point that a, by creating some of those house rules or saying this works better in this situation, you have made a design choice. Yeah. The only thing that separates you from that is uh, from being a designer at that point is like personal gatekeeping, which can be unhealthy, but, but for some people it's like a healthy way of like motivating themselves to do things. I, I personally think don't create like weird legitimacy gaps for yourself. If you want to be a game designer, let yourself be a game designer. Mm -hmm. Now that we know a little bit about you and who you are, um, we want to get into the really fun stuff of our episode. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> um, so our goal with these episodes is to help people become the best possible players at the table. There is tons of GM advice out there. I don't feel like there's nearly as much advice for players. So on our podcast, we make all kinds of really cool characters, but now we want to give people the chance to play them in the best way possible and have the most fantastic experience that they can. And uh, one of the ways to improve your experience at the table is to let yourself get immersed in the game, the story, and the character. So today we're going to be talking about using voices to help you really embody your characters. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, voice work, I think, is is one of the big aspects of, of role play. So I'm really glad that you guys touched on the subject. It's, it's very close and dear to my heart. Let's start at the beginning then. James, how did you become an expert on voices? Uh, that's a pretty lofty thing, but I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... 
I don't know that I'm an expert, but I really, really do enjoy the process of creating character voices, and, and I like doing voices generally. My fascination with it probably started in, like, middle school with, like, doing improv and acting and stuff, just, like, doing voices with my friends. And when I was in college, my... I think like my third character like had a distinct voice and like after that uh, voice became one of the primary ways that I would create a new character and then signify that I was playing a character versus just speaking out of character. Um, so it just habit and uh, doing it for a long time and enjoying it. Nice. So why would you suggest that people use voices to embody their characters and why in particular do you like doing them? Okay, this is where we get into uh, a little bit of my philosophy of play and that's the character's voice is one of the few things that you as the player can actually bring to life at the table. You know, if you are just playing a tabletop game, if you're not LARPing or something, you're not really embodying a character. There usually aren't props. Uh, most of the time when your character is doing something uh, that is truly them, uh, you're rolling or, or doing a game move for it. Uh, you're, you're engaging with the system somehow to make it happen. But when that character talks, you talk. Mm -hmm. So it, its voice is your voice. So in a moment when we engage a character voice and, and actually put that on, we're becoming that character and we are bringing them to life in that moment more so than anything else that we do. So that makes the character real. Um, and if their voice is distinct from your voice, it's like in acting, there's uh, something called mask work. Like you put on a mask mm -hmm. and your body and movements change um, and you become different as a person. It's sort of like a totemic summoning of the performance that you're doing. And I think that's very similar with voice work in role playing games. I like giving characters unique voices because I think it's fun, mm -hmm. but also I think it is this sort of semi-mystical summoning of the <laughs> character at the table. It's it's the realest thing that you can do with them. Uh, so I think if, if performance of a character, if like immersing yourself in the story is one of the things that really appeals to you as a role player, I would suggest having some sort of character voice work just because it adds that much more impact to the experience. Uh, when I am voicing a character, I will make decisions that surprise myself. I get to points where there'll be sometimes when we're discussing campaign and Kat is talking about like things that She's like, oh, I'd, I'd like to see this. I'd, I'd like us to get here. And she goes like, uh, do you think uh, you can make Bacta do that? And I go, yeah, I guess we'll see in the moment because <laughs> I don't know what Bacta is going to do. Bacta knows what he's going to do <laughs> and he'll actually make that decision more than I will. Mm -hmm. So that, that I, I think the voice can really lead you to interesting and surprising places and make the experience of play that much more impactful. What would you say then to somebody that might be a little too shy or a little too embarrassed to try embodying that sort of uh, commitment at the table. So I, I think a lot of people, when they picture character voices, they picture strong character voices. They picture like accents, which I think that is a very particular procl proclivity uh, that a performer can or have at the table or a player can have at the table. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be that strong. It just needs to be something that's different enough. And like we'll, we'll talk about the different terms involved in this different enough from the way that you speak that it is a distinct person. So you, you might not think of yourself as, as doing a voice, but like you create voice work that creates a separate character. I think a really good example of this that uh, is out there in the pop culture that, that people might understand is like, if you listen to the adventure zone, uh, Travis's character Magnus starts very, very close to his spine. And I will talk about that term in a little bit, <laughs> but it, it's basically just Travis McElroy is being Travis McElroy. And that's the character. And slowly throughout the series, Magnus has just a slight difference in the way that he speaks from how oh. Travis speaks. 
And that creates the character. Even the tiniest difference creates a huge difference in personality Mm -hmm. and, and, and what that person is. So if you are a shy person, if you don't think of yourself as a performer, if if you're not going to bust out an accent at the drop of the hat, that's okay because there are different techniques that can help you engage with a character uh, that are not so extreme and won't make you so self-conscious. The the other thing is like, honestly, at the end of the day, you shouldn't feel pressured to do anything at the table that you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. If, if voice and a character ain't your thing, that's fine. That's, yeah. that, that's, that's more than fine. Uh, but if you're curious about it and you feel like your self-consciousness might get in the way, I think we're going to have some exercises for you that will, that will help you generate those voices without feeling so self-conscious. Yeah. I listened back to one of your critical success episodes from like four years ago. But one thing that you said in there that stuck with me um, was not so much that you have to, you don't have to make people believe that you are someone else. You just need to forget that you are pretending to be someone else. Yeah. Um, And that it, is a subtle but important difference, I think, that it just needs to be different enough that you kind of forget that you're, you know, it's like when you go see a play or something for the first, you know, couple minutes, you're like, okay, this is all happening on a stage. And then after a little while, you're, you're watching it um, almost a little bit differently, like it's actually happening. You kind of forget that you are in a theater or that it's, you know, that it's not real. Yeah, you get, you get immersed in that performance and, and that performer's work. And I, I think it is the difference between... Like a Daniel Day-Lewis performance, like he has really taken on that character. Mm -hmm. A later career Jack Nicholson uh, appearance, it's, oh, look, it's Jack Nicholson saying lines. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But like for Daniel Day-Lewis, he's like really losing himself in the thing. And so I think a thing, like if you're thinking about being self-conscious or like being so grounded in yourself, like that's a Jack Nicholson thing. Like you were there just saying the things that the character would say. Um, and if you're Dan- Daniel Day Lewis saying it, the character is saying it. And you don't, that has nothing to do with the other people at the table. Like you don't need to be doing the best British accent or whatever mm-hmm. uh, to be your character. It just needs to be different enough for you that it helps you sort of lead you in a certain direction. And even if you don't start with a voice, like during a campaign with a, a new character, you can always get into it later on. You can start with your regular voice, and then once you figure out what the character is, who they are as a person, maybe those little nuances will naturally leak into your portrayal of your character. That, that's absolutely true. I, I think it is easier if, if you start out that way because characters, a lot in characters and, and characterization, I think is based around momentum. Mm-hmm. And I, I think if we look at my performances back to the character originally started out with a much gruffer voice and the more recent episodes, it's a lot smoother. Like, I think uh, the first Bechter voice lines were down here and this is how the character sounds. (laughs) But these days, Bechter's up here. He's still got a little bit of that gruffness in his voice, but, uh, you know, he's uh, more of a parental figure. So he has a bit of a strict (laughs) speech pattern to himself and he's very skeptical of the things that his friends are saying. And that was all here. That was all in the original version because I was a grizzled mercenary and out for (laughs) revenge. Uh, But slowly through the campaign, different things became important to the character. And so I started using different aspects of that character's voice. Like the the flagstones were already there and momentum sort of pushed them there. Mm -hmm. And you can certainly make the active choice in the middle of the game to add something new to a character. Like if you listen to this episode and get really excited about the possibilities, you can absolutely sit down at your table and find a character voice. It's not too late. You can start anytime. (laughs) But I do think it's easier to start with something, even if that thing is a bigger commitment than like you think you're ultimately going to be able to keep up Mm -hmm. things of that original thing that you tried to do uh, elements of that are going to leak into what becomes your final voice for the character. And I I think a lot of people, a lot of people listen to a lot of actual play podcasts and things like that. And I, I think you need to remember a, in a lot of cases, those are professional actors. B those are edited 
they're not perfect all the time. Having been on one, I can tell you there are lots of things that get edited out. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's it doesn't have to be perfect all the time, and it's okay to make mistakes and try it out. And if it doesn't work, that's fine too. Um, yeah. I, I don't think that you should feel pressured to be perfect or to be on all the time too. Like that's okay to kind of mess around and see what works. It, yeah. it, it's a lot messier than I think podcasts make it sound sometimes. If you are not doing a podcast, who is this voice work for? I mean, uh, the answer could be that you're trying to entertain your friends around the table, but ultimately it's for you. So like, are you interested in perfection? That's a stupid thing to be interested in because this is a really subjective thing that we're talking about. This is like, this is personal performance art. It's not going to matter if you're perfect. There are like six people with you uh, anyway. So the thing that the voice work should do is make you enjoy the game more. There's no pressure on this absolutely whatsoever. Um, if you want to improve and feel like you're getting better at voice work, that's that's fine and it's fine to have that goal. But it, you know, improving is a process. It doesn't matter where you are right now. It just matters that you're working on it. And if that work is fun, then you're probably doing a good thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and you're not going to get better unless you try it. So, you know, yeah. give, it, give it a go. <laughs> you got to jump in the pool to swim around. Yep, exactly. How do you think that using a different voice from for your character can help you play better? So this is where I want to talk about spine work. Um, So in improv, to generate characters, uh, one of the techniques uh, is spine work. And we think of characters in terms of spine. And like literally that means your actual spine and your skeleton right now. Um, The way you hold yourself and the way uh, you sit, uh, whether you're slouched over a little bit, whether you've got your back straight, people when they walk around in their day to day, like people are the characters of this world. (laughs) There are NPCs and whatnot. And the way a person walks around and and, and holds themselves reflects a lot of their personality and like a lot of that, that will translate into almost everything they do. They'll translate into the way they gesticulate with their hands. That'll translate into the facial expressions they make and translate in ultimately into their voice as well. So when we are trying to create a character in an instant, after we get a suggestion to start our scene or after we come out of an intro uh, for our opening uh, segment in a Herald, you are trying to generate a strong sense of character immediately and changing your spine factors into that. When a performer is essentially being themselves, we call that as a character close to your spine, Mm. because that's just someone who acts the way you do and talks the way you do. And in improv, like uh, we point out, it's, it's important to remember that that's not you. That character might even have your name, but it's not you. That character is empowered to make decisions that you will not make as a performer. Mm -hmm. So even that is different. If you're playing something close to your spine, there's still a separation between that thing and you. A great example of this, if you've played one of the end of the world RPGs that Fantasy Flight puts out, (laughs) like you make yourself as a character and your friends collaborate on that with you. Mm -hmm. But that character is still not you. And likely in those games, they will do (laughs) things that you would never do. Um, I shot a zombie. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's a huge like moral quandary uh-huh. if like we were to put it in real life, but but in the game there's separation. So even playing a character close to your spine and thinking of it in terms of this is not me, this is a character close to my spine, that creates a separation which empowers you when you're speaking and when you're thinking about decisions that the character is making to do different things uh, than you might do. Because like if there was a werewolf or something and that, that came up in the end of the world system, like Perhaps most of us would just bar ourselves inside an apartment and call the police and wait for this horrible problem mm-hmm. to be over. But in a game, it's more fun if like, we go out and try to find silver and fight the werewolf for ourselves. Right. Uh, so what can having this voice do? What can having this character that's just a little a, a, a half a millimeter off your spine do? Uh, well, it can help you make more interesting decisions in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if we get to a character that's far from your spine, like dramatically different, if I was playing a character who has a straight back um, and speaks very properly and is very careful about everything that he's saying, I'm, I'm up here. 
it's it's a different person, and I'm holding myself and my my face differently. You, if you were in the studio with me, you'd see that my gesticulation is a lot more subdued, and uh, that uh, my lips are more careful in their movements. Uh, so, that, and that's way different than my slouchy normal <laughs> form. That character is going to be a lot more careful in his speech. There are going to be fewer ums and uhs that he has. He's Mm -hmm. going to be so much more deliberate with his sentence structure and whatnot. And it's also going to translate to his in-character decisions. When I'm thinking about that character's bodily movements, as a fighter, he is not a barroom brawler just hurling around his fists left and right. Uh, He might be a Queensberry boxer or he might uh, be a fencer. Very uh, slight, deliberate movements uh, that are still like a factor in the battle and like like they matter, but it just shapes him so much differently. Mm -hmm. And all of that comes out of the way he was speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, Another example of this, if in A Woman with Hollow Eyes, I play a character called Calvin, who is very new to a magical world that's like full of secrets. And he just emerged from this thing called Shadow, which is our world. Um, Mm -hmm. The idea is like Matrix-like. There's this huge fantasy in the Invisible Sun role-playing system that is the real world. And actually, there's this magical world and all these other dimensions just beyond Shadow. Mm -hmm. So Calvin emerged new to this world and he's a very excitable person very curious about that world and so when i talk i'm talking like this and already you notice that (laughs) this is a different person even though the voice is essentially the same voice but he's so much happier to be talking about the things that he's talking about and the way he says things he'll move very quickly and then he'll slow down and think about things but that also determines calvin's movements as a character when calvin makes a decision he will run toward it and rush toward it a lot like his voice. He'll move very, very quickly and then he'll be caught in a mess and slow down again, reflective of his voice. And that has led to so many moments in A Woman With Hollow Eyes where Calvin has made decisions as the character that I, as the player, could not have conceived of at the start of that campaign. Mm. There was an episode where we were supposed to go on a heist together and he got in an argument with uh, his other party members and it got heated and emotional and it was it was over things that were important to all of them. So they ended up not doing the thing that we were supposed <laughs> to be doing that session because the character's emotional like state of being had just led it that way. So to circle back to the original question, what does it do to help you? It empowers you to make decisions that you wouldn't normally make. And that can be really valuable and cool. Oh, definitely. It gives you a little bit of separation to be able to kind of step out of your own body a little bit, I think, and to like visualize it being different and to start sort of seeing things through your character's eyes rather than yourself watching a character, which is, I think, how a lot of people play at the beginning and certainly how I started, you know, it was like imagining this other person doing these things. And so I think when you start to embody a character in that way, you can start looking through their eyes rather than like sort of watching it from above that's, or like you're watching a movie. That's mm-hmm. uh, that's a, such a good point. Just your imaginary narration like in your head putting together these scenes. Are you looking at the character from the outside or are you in the character's body making the character's decisions? And uh, the way you're framing voice and your performance can actually have a dramatic difference on that. Definitely. And you did touch, uh, touch on a, a couple techniques already, but Aside from things like accent and and playing closer, further away from the spine, are there other techniques that you can let us know to help us achieve different voices at the table? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because there (laughs) there are a lot of different ways to engage this. The most obvious ways, again, are... You know, accents, it, it's, it's something that people can see and like really grok easily right away. So uh, once you get beyond that, uh, we get into the more advanced territory of spine work. And this is something that you can practice at home uh, really easily. Take note of how you're sitting and just change it mm-hmm. and then talk. <laughs> um, uh, we can actually, Amelia, you, you just sat up straight. So try talking as this character is sat up straight. And I, I think the way that you're holding your head, I feel like they're a thoughtful person about what they're presenting to other people. So just speak as this character for me. What, what do they sound like? I feel when I sit up a little bit straighter, I feel like more authoritative 
more like comfortable in what I'm doing. Uh, so more prepared, I feel like when I'm slouching, it's kind of like, OK, well, you know, see what happens. It's a it's a more like casual. And you, you can know. see her and voice. So the difference mm-hmm. when I sit up straight is like, OK, I'm here. I'm ready to do things. I know what's happening. Like mm-hmm. and just and I notice that like even when I'm sitting at work too, like when I'm ready to actually do something, I will sit up straighter than when <laughs> I'm like, OK, I gotta get this done. Yeah. Like. I mean, <laughs> slouching Amelia, is the, the casual sort of resting Amelia is different is a different person than the Amelia who's sitting up straight and ready to do a task. You are literally different people in that moment. That's what spine work's about, and you can do that pretty dramatically. Like, you can hunch and bring up your shoulders, and already you're starting to be, like, a different, creepier, weirder Mm -hmm. person. This might be, like, a goblin or a kobold character. Or uh, you can sort of slump your whole body and then sort of slow down your speech and maybe talk lower. And maybe this is a thoughtful character, someone (laughs) sad perhaps an artist Um, (laughs) and just try sitting differently and just talking and seeing where that leads you. And, and I will say, I think spine work is probably one of the more advanced things. Uh, It's something that you build up to in acting, but I think it's pretty easy to visualize if you're sitting there at home, other techniques, emotion, emotion Mm -hmm. is a huge technique. When you are angry, you can be a different base character than what you are normally. And at Second City, one way they teach you to explore emotion is just numbering it. If I'm playing an angry character, let's start at a one. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, this is me normally, and this is me when I'm angry. Mm -hmm. So already you can see the way I'm structuring my sentences is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. There's kind of an edge behind this voice. I wouldn't want to greet you guys coming into the room like this because you might think that (laughs) I'm about to like jump on you or something. Yeah, it's a little more staccato. Like it's a little... And, and I'm waving my hands like people yeah, can like, see. Yeah, like people can like, see. Like, like it's a, you know, like <laughs> on this on this auditory right, medium. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like we can we can take that farther. We can take it up to a five. Uh, this person is very different. They're a bit louder. Uh, they're sharper still. They they've still got that staccato. Mm-hmm. But boy, howdy, are they angry? And let's you know take it all the way further. Let's take it up to like an eight. And an eight, still very clipped and angry. All of those those three different voices, they can be your base for a character. Mm-hmm. Let's start up at, at the higher one. You wouldn't probably be able to maintain this the whole game. No. But you can take the core of this and back it down into something that I could probably speak like this. I could speak like this as a character throughout an entire game. Every time I say something, let's storm that door. The way that we're going to get around it is you are going to check it for traps. I'm going to prepare a spell and you better have your crossbow ready. Understood? (laughs) That is a very strict character. Mm -hmm. They're precise in their thinking. I think they're a little bit like unhinged. Um, (laughs) a little bit yeah but then we can we can go to this middle character here the five we can't be yelling the whole game so we're gonna back it off here and now i'm more of a a more of a strict character it's a little bit hard to approach me so let's make it a little bit friendlier uh so now i'm here uh i still talk about the same way i've got a little bit of a kermit the frog thing going (laughs) on just a just a tiny hint of that but i could be like a teacher I could be a third mm-hmm. grade teacher who's just so interested in seeing what you're doing. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that, that you finished that painting. It looks fantastic. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's put it up on the wall. And so that started with a five from anger. I mm-hmm. just took aspects of that and made it the flat character. And then uh, moving down to the one, this character who's sort of threatening in the way they talk. Uh, we could, uh, could add a bit of an accent. Now they're not threatening. They're just a tough cowboy. That's how they've always talked. (laughs) Or we could add some like skepticism. And uh, now perhaps the detective talks like this. Perhaps I'm someone with an agenda who wants to find out more about you and what you did on Friday at 8 Mm p.m. Let's investigate that. (laughs) Uh, So all of those characters, again, are based singularly off 
anger, a a very simple emotion that we all understand. And even if we're not actors, we, we know sort of what that looks like. And just in trying to portray that, there are elements of different characters. You as a person have an element of joy, of sadness, of fear, of anger in how you conduct yourself as a person in your everyday life. And as you change those, you invent different characters. So that is emotion. Let's see, moving past emotion, uh, we can get into speech pattern. Speech pattern is something that I've been manipulating throughout this whole thing. Speech pattern can be something like changing the speed of your words and how you say them. If we were to take this, we could make it deep and slow to create an ent. They talk slowly and think slowly, and it's fine. Or we could take this same sort of meandering thought and create some kind of fairy who's just hanging out in a forest glade and wants to welcome you to the feast. (laughs) Changing your speech pattern creates a different character because, Mm -hmm. like, you as a person just talk differently than other people. Mm -hmm. And one of the real fun things about speech pattern is you can listen to your friends and you can create new characters based off of their own quirks and how they talk. Like, God, who do I want to put on blast right now? (laughs) You got Jim McClure. Jim McClure, uh, (laughs) he's pretty bombastic, uh, makes a lot of declarative statements. Uh, He's big. He's out there. He is the bad boy of RPGs. <laughs> uh, so, like, in, in doing that, Jim has a much different speech pattern. He talks like someone who is closing a million-dollar deal with, Always. like, literally yeah. everything <laughs> that he says. He'll make uh, big declarative statements. He'll drop the truth on the table right in front of you like he's throwing down a huge hunk of meat. That's Jim McClure. And you, you can take that and build an entire character out of that, whether that character is a salesman, a, a senator, a general, like all of that is is in the bones of Jim's speech. Um, and that's just in speech pattern. That's just in saying words differently. Getting close to emotion, uh, one of the things that I put in the game Noisy Person cards uh, is descriptors Mm -hmm. uh, for characters. What a character's general mood or personality is like can actually create a different character. Let's start with a familiar base, a character like an ogre. An ogre might have a deep voice and talk like this because he's got a big mouth and sharp teeth. That character is like pretty threatening and specific, but mm-hmm. we can make it more approachable by throwing a descriptor on it. Let's make him confused. So this as a character becomes this, and I'm not quite sure of myself, and I'm actually pretty self-conscious and getting more nervous. <laughs> um, he's still got those sharp teeth. He's still huge. He's still got a gruff voice, but he's a lot more approachable and friendly. And he can just talk like this all the time. He can actually be pretty confident and sure about what he's saying while being confused. And the weird thing is you can take a confused character and you can make them confused. So that actually increases it. And you know what? This can be your new voice space for a character. (laughs) It's a confused, confused ogre. And even that character can be pretty certain about what he's saying. In changing things around like that and adding uh, descriptors, not only do you create a new way of speaking for an existing character, but you create a brand new character. Uh, Whatever you start with the base, that base can experience different emotions. So the emotion work that you ran through, that that 1 through 10 intensity scale uh, that we taught you about, you can apply that to another character voice. You can take one of those speech pattern characters that you've come up with and you can put emotion or descriptors on them to fluctuate around and create new characters Mm. so it's this branching thing right of i've created a character voice and you know i've got 10 slots in that for different emotional intensities but each one of those branching out of it has like 
a thousand slots for descriptors. So you, uh, just by working on basic exercises that are so close to the way that you talk normally um, in your bass voice, uh, you have a plethora of different things that you can do and they are all different and all unique. And don't be afraid to feel like you fall into like a similar pattern of things and whatnot. That's just something that you need to stretch and grow as a performer. And, and I noticed throughout this whole time when you're doing all these example voices, your face <laughs> changes dramatically uh, and sometimes subtly uh, between the different voices, like the the more furrowed brow when you're angry or, uh, you know, the more raised and, and light your voice is, it really helps to get you into that character, it seems. Even when you were thinking about those things and describing how I was acting, you did it. Ryan. Yeah, I like saw you do it. I saw you brighten up, <laughs> which is so cool. So like even just thinking about these things and, and picturing what they might be in your head will change you enough that you've invented a new character and, and mm -hmm. discovered a new thing, which I think is super cool. I'm trying to think if there are any other like really good exercises that I can give people for characters. I mean, one big thing that if you just want to practice, practice doing impressions. And that's something you can do in the shower, in the car, mm -hmm. in private moments between things. What One big thing, like I think when I discovered that I was really, really good at doing voices was a, a Gen Con. Like I think my second or first, I think it's second Gen Con. My second Gen Con. Uh, we played in a Chaosium game where you're playing Batman villains <laughs> and I got to play the Joker and I had noticed like one day in college uh, after watching a Batman the Animated Series episode I just hit on saying baby you're the greatest <laughs> and I took from there from being able to just say that one phrase to slowly being able to embody that character and engage with different aspects of his personality. So when I was handed that character sheet at the table, I was able to fly off the handle and really get in there. And it like that game at the end of the game, everybody like voted on who they thought was the best role player. And uh, because of that, I got like a discount on a, on a call of Cthulhu book that I still have. So nice. like, it was a very cool moment, but it's all because in my private moments, like I took the time to actually like work on this impression mm -hmm. and even like, you can listen to this voice and you can see how it might have been inspired by Mark Hamill and <laughs> his portrayal, but you know, I can't quite go as high as Hamill. <laughs> it's impossible for me. It doesn't work with my vocal cords. So I stay here in the lower ranges. And I do move up occasionally, but it's only up like this. I can't do the squeaking screech <laughs> that Hamill can do, but I can get very low indeed down here. <laughs> so it's technically a bad impression of Mark Hamill, but actually it's become my own very good joker. <laughs> so like, even if you're doing a bad impression, you will invent a good voice on the way that is wholly yours, mm -hmm. is, is the point I'm trying to make there. Um, so I, I think that is a good slate of base exercises for that thing. Uh, ho hopefully people were able to follow those and, you know, don't worry. Like I've been doing this for literal years, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, on one shot I am playing like e each episode, I probably play about five different characters because I'm GMing most of the time. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm jumping in and out of those exercises. Like it's easy. It's not. It's not. It's something that you do with, with practice and mm -hmm. time. And it's important not to be judgmental over yourself for that. Just make sure that you're having fun. And it does not mm -hmm. matter if the voice is bad as long as you're having fun with it. Absolutely. And I think it's, I mean, it's important to remember that this is like anything else that you do in your life, whether it's working out or writing or you know, anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to get better the more you do it. Yeah. And everything takes practice. Role playing takes practice. Yep, and every aspect of it. Absolutely. And so I think that, you know, like, don't be hard on yourself in the beginning. And it's like, give it time and mm -hmm. keep working with it. And as long as you are enjoying it, then you're fine. That's yeah. all that really matters. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if you're having fun, then that's good enough. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really can't emphasize that enough. It's all about fun. And I think if you take the dive, if you let yourself enjoy that space without judgment, you will 
have fun, and you will get to a point where people will be impressed by you. If that's what you're after. Uh, Kat's really good at voices, um, even though she won't credit herself for that. <laughs> and she impresses a lot of people. It, it's not a thing that she focuses on. She just does them because she likes them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she is really good at them. She's so. really good at them. <laughs> I do want to ask, do you have any suggestions about things that people should kind of be mindful of when they're trying out character voices? Particularly in the case of accents, I think it can be problematic if yeah. you're not careful. And I think that's something that I, I, I feel like we would be remiss if we didn't discuss at least a little bit. Um, it's, a, it's a super important thing, uh, like really, really important, something that we're, we try to be mindful on uh, from one shot all the time. I, I'll say that being at a table uh, that's just your friends, that you're not recording as a podcast, the, the, the rules are probably a little bit different because the only thing that matters is like what the people at the table are looking for. Uh, I, I just generally advise folks like, hey, if you're a white dude, probably not a great idea to do an ethnic accent of almost any kind. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of think doing a British accent, good or bad, British, you're always punching up. <laughs> 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 they they took over the world so like they can be inundated with bad accents. I, I think it does not look great on people, generally speaking, if you're doing a... Uh, you, you know, an Indian accent as, as, as a white person, um, like even, even if you're good at it, mm -hmm. like I, I think it, it, it's probably not going to come off well. <sighs> the a way to think of it is punching up versus punching down. Mm -hmm. And like, even if you mean an accent as an homage, it can still be a punch. So really think about it. There are some people who have uh, contacted us being concerned about one-shot episodes, um, particularly ones uh, that we hit in Asian settings, uh, like our Tenra Bancho Zero episodes and our L5R episodes, mm -hmm. um, because when I approached those characters, I approached them as though I was an anime and I was using voices that I heard from voice actors in anime. And they're often speaking a very particular way mm -hmm. because a voice actor for an anime is trying to ADR with existing character animation. So they'll generally talk a bit slower and more deliberately um, uh, with voices that fluctuate in interesting ways because they are trying to match those character mouths. Some people saw that as offensive. And that's like, that's, I'm not doing an Asian accent there. I am just speaking in a way that uh, is from media that I am familiar with. Mm -hmm. But even that can be sensitive. So I, I really, really advise against doing any sort of ethnic accent work because if you don't want to hurt people, you know, don't put yourself in a position where you might do that. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't want to discourage people from trying new things and trying out, you know, trying out voices and, and having the room to sort of kind of experiment and see what fits. But I think it's important to remember that that certain things can be problematic and that, you know, I ignorance isn't maybe necessarily a good excuse. Yeah. It, and how you use and, and portray things is like it so sensitive. It, it matters. Mm -hmm. it, it's sensitive and it's tough. Like I, I, I think and if you are somebody who, who is looking to portray, I, I think something that I find more acceptable generally uh, than than doing an ethnic accent is doing the voice of a recognized performer. And I, I think that is all right. Um, it could still be a, a touchy, sensitive area. So you want to think about it. And if it's part of your thought process, I, I think you are on the right direction. Because like I said, I, like Amelia said, uh, we don't want to dissuade people from doing things. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the X card is super important mm -hmm. in this. And like, you know, you might just need to X someone's accent or someone might need to X what you're doing. Mm -hmm. that, that's okay. That's okay. Just be careful with it. And especially if you're going to export this at all, do an actual play program at all, like really, really examine yourself. And what is that voice doing? What are you trying to accomplish with that voice? Um, because intent is, is going to matter in it. If you mess up, your intent is not going to protect you. But keeping a good intent is probably going to steer you away from messing up more, more so than it will guide you to danger. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that you brought up an important point about thinking about why it is that you're doing that, because I think 
through the course of this, we've gone through lots of other tools. And so I, I think it's important to think about what is what is it that you think that you're or you're hoping to accomplish with that mm -hmm. and then decide is that the best way to go about doing it yeah. um because if it's you know you're trying to embody certain character traits maybe consider are there other things that might do that in a better way or a way that is less problematic less offensive because there are lots of tools at your disposal and i think that it's important to to look at the swath of things available to you and say, am I picking the right tools to do this in the best possible way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like your circumstances for, for what, what can be fine and, and what could be offensive are different. If I'm at the table with a Southerner and I'm doing a bad Southern accent, <laughs> they might think I'm making fun of them, which, mm -hmm. which do, that's not okay. Like, God, when I was doing the star-crossed episode that we streamed with Alex, uh, we were in British Columbia for that. Mm -hmm. And partway through, I started doing a pretty subtle that snuck up on me Canadian accent. And oh. Alex called me out oh. and the stream <laughs> called me out like partway through. And I, I think she was doing a Canadian accent that's a little thicker than her, her normal one. So I, I got drawn into it. But like, yeah. Doing Canadian accent, probably fine most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're at the table with a Canadian person, you know, you could get into the area where it's a little sensitive and mm -hmm. you just you just have to be sensitive to other people. Like if what you're doing is causing harm, stop doing it. Yeah. <laughs> That's, <very laughs> That's really simple. solid life advice. It's <laughs> good for any situation, really. Yeah. Maybe don't do that. <laughs> maybe don't. Maybe don't. Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't need to defend it. You you can be sorry. Being sorry is fine. Trying to excuse yourself uh, from from what you did is, is less fine. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a natural instinct, but it's like a bad one. Right? Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, a good thing to remember, too, in all of this is that if somebody says, you know what, I'm not really OK with that, just say, OK, that's fine and move on. Yeah. Like I know Alex said, it's it, taking no graciously mm -hmm. um, when yeah. we talked about it. And that's a really it's a tough thing to do. And it, it takes a lot of a lot of willpower to not kind of try and defend yourself and make excuses and things like that. It's, it's, a, it's a hard it's a hard skill and it can make you feel uh, self-conscious. But at the end of the day, if you get good at it, you'll be a better person. Yep. Totally worth it. <laughs> <laughs> worth the effort. So then how do we go around picking the right voice for the characters that we make? So this is, man, there, there's so much to this, right? I, I think I create different character voices based on the initial concepts that I have in character creation. Bacta is a great example I built him as a very tough character who has a military background, a really tragic backstory. So that gruff voice down here that was perfect for him. And the needs of that character sort of evolved and changed the voice naturally to be the victor that we know and love today. And that is, that's all a process. So like, I think I, picking that initial voice uh, was, I was like looking for qualities that I thought that, that would convey someone who was tough, someone who had been through some stuff. And so that low gravel, I felt like, yeah, that feels like very military cool guy. And I was obviously, I was basing that on a thousand things. There's like Master Chief from Halo. <laughs> There's, of course, you know, the wonderful voice actor uh, working on Clone Wars, portraying uh, Boba Fett and Jango Fett in the Star Wars films. Like th there was so much of it in that so picking the right voice for the character is I think you just got to decide what aspects of this character, what are the most important aspects of this character's personality? Like, let's take some characters that you guys have built on creation cast mm -hmm. and, and, and think through this. Uh, just who, who's standing out to you in your minds? Just refresh the audience's memory. Well, the one that I've been trying to practice the most and unfortunately haven't had enough time yet, but... Uh, Mishra from our masks episodes. Uh, let's let's remind. Uh, I haven't gotten to your masks episodes yet. Oh, uh, what 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 is Mishra's? Okay, so Mishra is a feline alien um, from a different planet, and she crash landed on Earth and has been walking amongst humans for about four years. Okay, or so, and only within the last year or two, she's actually been more comfortable in society. And she found a group of friends to enjoy life with. Mm -hmm. 
And now she is happy. And she okay. is a very bright spirit in the room. So so this is like a pretty rich and complex character because like feline, that just says a lot. Uh, animal mm-hmm. qualities like will do a lot to you and it can lead you in a lot of different directions. You know, I, I think any of the great Catwoman voices over mm-hmm. the years will tell you like one aspect of like a feline personality trait that people think very tough. I think very much of myself. I'm careful with what I say and what I say has authority. But, you know, this picks up on another aspect of, like, feline vocal patterns, and it's being skittish and careful. You're still rolling a little bit, uh, still a bit bit tough, maybe a bit standoffish, but more careful. And you can take that vocal pattern, and you can become comfortable and friendly and really enjoy yourself around your friends and... I think when I think of a cat, I think of the way a cat's tail moves. Mm -hmm. It's got that sort of like swishy, deliberate thing where Mm -hmm. it like owns everything around it. Oh, yeah. And being very at home and comfortable around my friends. And (laughs) even though I've crash landed on this planet, I've come to find some happiness here. So like what would you say are the most important character traits for Mishra as just as a person? I think her, her defining personality trait would be her optimism. So what does an optimistic version of you sound like? <laughs> this is the optimistic version. Well, no, I mean, uh, le- like let's say you were we're planning a picnic. Yep. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's the weather going to be like? Hopefully sunny. Yeah. So like I think it's always a little yeah. bit higher. Yeah. Um you sit up a little bit straighter. Mm-hmm. Okay. Your eyes are a little bit wider. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of like everything is it, Again, I'm just going to gesture with my hands because everybody can see that. But it's like yeah. up here. It's up, yeah. it's up here as opposed to like when you're kind of down yeah. and you're I, like, like a little bit low. Just, just right away, up. you you pictured that. You, you you created that. So if Mishra, Mishra is up here, Mishra being optimistic and hopeful. Well, let's say the, the chief of police calls Mishra's superhero <laughs> team to, to bring them in. Uh, what, what does Mishra think is going to happen? I would imagine maybe a, a accommodation. Maybe a medal or maybe... So ask me that question, are we getting a medal? But yeah. ask it as Mishra, focusing on that optimism. Are we getting a medal? Ooh, I like it. And th- you know what? There's still like a little bit of that feline caution in there. But it's like y- your eyes widened up and you you uh, had this character who was like, Maybe this is a maybe a prize <laughs> for me, though. <laughs> Which is very cat-like. We Ooh. know cats love their prizes. Yeah. <laughs> like something shiny that I can knock off a yeah. shelf. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so, yeah, like having optimism be your guiding aspect. Like it changed your physicality, which changed the way that you talked. Hmm. Let's, Amelia, let's focus on one of your characters. Who's somebody that you created that we want to try and craft a voice for? Ooh. I mean, we can go with my masks character, too. Oh, yeah. So Phoenix, who is a, is the doomed playbook. Um, oh boy. So, yeah. <laughs> She's very serious, very focused. She's got a, uh, a fiery temper to match her powers too. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because I don't make characters that are me. No. <laughs> at all. <laughs> Not even a remote. Yeah. A nerd with a temper problem. Mm-hmm. That's I don't know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, she's much more serious, focused, driven, does not have time for nonsense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. So I just made a pun and you are trying to tell me uh, that we need to focus on our mission. What, what, What does she sound like in saying that? We don't have time for nonsense. We have lots of things to do. There's an entire list over there. And if it doesn't get done, nothing here gets done. What does this character look like? She is on the shorter side, Mm -hmm. bright red hair. She Mm -hmm. always wears a lab coat and always has pens stuck in her hair. Okay. Okay. (laughs) What about her eyes? What do they do when she speaks? Like when she just looks at someone, what, what expression would they read on her face? Like imagine her in a superhero pose. Let's say it's the opening credits of the cartoon based on your masks game. Uh, (laughs) There's this flash where, you know, the character's name will appear on the screen. She turns to look at the camera. What is that expression like? I think probably brow slightly furrowed, one eyebrow raised, and her eyes are very bright. 
Okay, yeah. Eyes bright, shining out, sort of letting us know what her power set is. What I noticed, Amelia, when you did that voice initially, your voice dropped with hers. And you took on some of like your, I don't have time for you. I'm a little bit annoyed. It's uh, my mom voice. Yeah, that, that's exactly what you I was went say, yep. mom. Uh, so <laughs> like now you've, but there's also like an attitude there too. Uh, the eyebrow is raised to like introduce this character to other people. So it's perhaps a little bit snarky. So when we put this pun down, like, how are you just going to dismiss me uh, while tell, like, convincing the group that we don't need to listen to me, we need to focus on the mission? I mean, I feel like in reality, the best way to do that would be to ignore that you said anything entirely. <laughs> Ooh, I do. I do like. So, in, so you're ignoring what I'm saying and you're talking to Mishra now. I've just made a stupid pun and you are trying to refocus Mishra on the mission, what do you say to Mishra? <laughs> and Mishra would be laughing at the yeah, pun. Yeah, Mishra is laughing at the pun. You need to get things back on track. Right. Now is not the time. I need you to go over there, get the stuff, so that we can go. We have five minutes. Done. So much more <laughs> gentle with Mishra. <laughs> like, that character, and like you can see, it's just such a subtle fluctuation in that character and, and how Amelia voiced it. Still uh, short, sh still clipped, still annoyed. But like if you go back and listen to Amelia's first performance, there's a sharper edge directed at me and, and, and who I am and what my pun-loving character was right. <laughs> versus, versus Mishra, who is being distracted, and that doesn't help, but I do still need you to do things, so I'm going to try and be gentle about it. I'm annoyed at you and annoyed at the situation <laughs> yeah. with you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that led to kind of a different character voice. So, like, again... Your, your character is being mission focused. Like that's the thing that really shined out. And that, like that's the core of that voice. If we were to then take the optimism of, of Mishra and, and the sort of like, I mean, just the mom of <laughs> your character. <laughs> Let's now put those on the one to 10 scale uh, that we had. And I would call what you guys did initially about a three. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. pump it up to eight. Ooh. Oh boy. Just a statement of optimism. Again, let's go to Mishra thinking about the possibility of getting a medal. You really want that medal, and you think it's going to come. Let's, let's try it on, Ryan. I know it's tough, but let's try it. So we get off the phone mm -hmm. with uh, the... Chi the, the chief team. of police says uh, that he wants to see in his office right away. Yeah. Ooh, I, I, I bet we're going to get a medal. I, I can just feel it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can you can see in her voice her picturing the metal in her mind. It was again brighter and like y'all know how Ryan speaks. You've been listening to this podcast. He's got a much slower, more deliberate, thoughtful voice generally, but that is so different from his Mishra voice right there. Mm -hmm. uh, pumping it up to an 8. Let's Let's pump the mom up. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. <laughs> let's pump the mom up. Are we ready for this? Let's pump mom up to eight. Let's, let's, let's hear what that sounds like in her, her mouth. Um, let's say she's telling off a villain that they've defeated, you know? Just something simple like, uh, you're going to be behind bars for a long time. I saw what you did. It is not okay. It is not acceptable. There were people in that building. People could have died. And I don't care what it was that you thought that you were doing. You are done with it now. I love, I love this, especially like I can see that coming out of a teenage character mm -hmm. too. And that like, and that adds a lot <laughs> to the performance there. <laughs> Cause like you could, you could hear that character's like emotion in that and, and how deeply what happened affected her. So like I can say now, I think one of the cores of this character is like, her emotion and like how much she cares about things and, and how that affects her. Like you could hear earlier in the mom voice, it was trying to dismiss what's happening around her. Mm -hmm. um, but in this, when we pumped that mom up to eight, the core of mom is like emotion and compassion. Uh, she cared about those other people. And so while she was rebuking that villain, she did it in a way that's like, well, can't you see what you've done to these people? That was her first thought. It wasn't, you know, gloating over a defeated opponent or anything like that. So right there is just a perfect example of how voice can lead character. Because the only note that I gave you is like, be a mom, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. and you're in this situation. And what what she wanted to do was point out how wrong that was, (laughs) which says a lot about the character. That's a cool discovery. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fun. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. That was cool. I like it. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> Yay, voices. That's, that's voicing. Yay. That's voicing. And like, you know, those voices are not far off. I mean, obviously Ryan's voice has an accent to it, um, which is different than the way he normally speaks, but mm-hmm. like his speech patterns are sort of there. And, and Amelia is certainly like, I know that mom voice just comes out in the wild sometimes. <laughs> Uh, no, I never have to reprimand my children, ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but it could. It could if if, it if, could. if ever a child did anything wrong. Right. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, like, that that's still close to the spine, but, like, it tells us a lot about the character. And, like, if we let that voice run free, it will lead us in cool directions, too. Do you have advice on doing a voice that you have to maintain for a long time because obviously in playing back on campaign mm-hmm. that's something that you you probably had to think about when doing that knowing that you're going to be voicing that character over a long period of time versus some of the characters that you do on one shot where you know that it's just going to be a couple hours of having to be in that voice yeah. um those are you know they're they're different things there's sometimes that you're like i can only do this for an hour before my throat gets scratchy for sure for sure and, and like I mean, my ogre voices, my goblin voices, it is very possible to, you know, get in a growly voice and Mm -hmm. really mess yourself up. Uh, You will change your voice throughout a session if you're doing it for a sustained character. Like one character that I would do, you know, for three, four hour stretches was Lady Harpath, the prismatic paladin of the great dragon tyrant. Um, I did this for our Tomb of Annihilation series. And there's a version of this voice that is hard to maintain and can do a lot of damage. This version is actually okay. Uh, it, it doesn't hurt me that much, but that's because I settled into it. Probably I started here. And that is a lot rougher. Mm-hmm. So doing a voice for a long time will sort of naturally lead you into an easier version of that voice. Bicta, you know, he still has some grevel in his voice, but it's very slight and it's a lot different than the grevel mm-hmm. that he started with. So it, it's just something that being at the table is Bicta and experiencing emotions is Bicta. Having a n- more neutral state to start with, you naturally sort of... Uh, rein in some of that gravel Mm -hmm. because Becter definitely has the power to be angry and he's got the power to make threats and when he does that he might drop down here (laughs) so it's like you can guide yourself to a natural place I, I I would advise if you're doing a character with any sort of gravel in their voice be careful with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, check in with yourself. Yeah. If you feel anything in your throat, you're probably doing damage. Mm-hmm. One thing uh, that everybody should know is whispering is actually pretty bad for your voice oh. and, and can hurt you if like you do a lot of it unchecked. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you've got a character that like generally has a whispery voice, find don't do this. Find a way to talk that mm-hmm. sounds like a whisper, but you can still project with. Because mm-hmm. this, over time, will start to hurt. And this, over time, is fine, mm-hmm. but it still has that smooth quality of a whisper. You'll be able to do all the things that you wanted to do with the original whisper. So be careful about around whispers, gravel. You know, don't yell a lot. And really take care of yourself mm-hmm. take take the time to rest your voice uh drinking some tea tea is uh, like anything warm really anything warm that's not chocolate uh is going to be good for your throat mm-hmm. um it'll help relax it uh lemon and honey are, are good as well think about the voices really think about the voices that you're going to be doing over a long period of time it's it's okay to push yourself like i'm not the most overly cautious person about voices like you can hear that on one shot episodes i Mm. will maintain a rough voice for hours and hours if if i have to (laughs) and i'm having fun with it but as long as you take care of yourself after that you're probably going to be okay yeah Yeah, because i noticed uh when i was at a catacon last last year but I played a dwarf, so I brought a very gravelly voice to that character, and the next day, it hurt. I my, my voice was very sore, my throat was sore, and I know that if I were trying to do that over a longer period of time, 
I would definitely have to change something. Yeah, yeah. And like you kind of will naturally make those changes without noticing them. Because I mean, if you again, I, I keep going back to this, but if you listen to episode one of campaign versus episode 96 of campaign, back is a different sounding dude. And it's just because there were things about that character originally that like really could be rough on the voice. I mean, playing a dwarf character can have a really rough quality on your voice, especially if you're doing it in the back of your throat. Mm hmm. But if you focus more on the lips, you can still get kind of that gruff quality without putting so much strain on your throat. And that could be something that you discover naturally, or it could be something that you come across just as you're doing the voice over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Your voice will actually shift away from decisions that cause it pain. So... Just be aware of that. Like, check in with yourself while you're doing the voice. Practice with it. Find new things with it. And often I find uh, going through emotional change with a voice will, will help you uh, determine what is safest for you. Like if my dwarf were to get very angry, it sort of leads me in the direction that's not as good for, for my voice. But if he's happy, it's up here, you know? And that, that that's not quite as damaging. Mm-hmm. If you can only do one emotion with a voice, uh, I, I think you will actually find that it is more damaging to you simply because you're going to just be hitting the same part of your throat and vocal cords over and over again. Mm -hmm. If you can move along a scale with it, you'll find because it's more flexible and because it goes into different places naturally, it's just going to be easier to do. Another thing, deepening your voice. Deepening your voice can be an issue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Trying to go deep after a long time, especially if you're focusing the deepness in your throat. If you're portraying a large dragon, for instance, it can be troubling. But there are other ways you can deepen your voice. I'm trying to focus this mostly in my chest and stomach. Pulling up, it makes my speech much slower. But this is actually much more well supported. It's easier on my voice because it's coming from the diaphragm. You know, you might have to make the decision like, I do want my dragon to be the throaty depth, but I'm going to be doing it for the whole four hour session. So <laughs> it's probably better to do this dragon here. And if I need to add some of that throaty intensity that I had earlier, I'll just make it angry. This way, I'm not engaging with my throat as much. I'm still doing the diaphragm voice, but I've got that sharper edge. And that's based on how I'm using my... My uh, speech pattern. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, play around with it. It, it. Generally, generally, if a voice is flexible, it will be less damaging and easier to do. But again, check in with yourself. Make sure that you take care of yourself after the fact if you do something that does push you or strain you. Mm -hmm. I like, think that's another area, though, where practice will help because I think you'll kind of settle into what feels yeah. comfortable for you too because I think it probably doesn't take long to figure out this is not something that I like doing for long periods of time yeah. and it's not fun anymore if it hurts my throat and, and like I so, often find even when I don't role play if I'm leaving a convention my voice is a little raw and oh, it hurts yeah. just yeah. because you're yelling and you're talking a lot and you're just so uh -huh. excited about everything <laughs> yeah so even speaking in your natural voice can be damaging mm -hmm. um, so the, the really important thing is just care how mm -hmm. do you care for it after the fact <laughs> if you are someone who is deep into this stuff taking an acting class that focuses on voice will help you. You will learn how to project. You will learn how to control your breath and diaphragm, which there are lessons that I haven't super well internalized, but the, the few things that I have managed to grab from those classes have been, been tremendously helpful. So if, you know, this is your thing, if voice acting is going to be your thing, take a couple classes, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it can do wonders. I, we talked a little bit about it, but I, I want to talk a little bit more about noisy person cards, mm. which is half of the reason why I wanted to ask you to do this episode <laughs> with us. Because um, I thought, I was like, well, you made a game to do this exact thing. So can you talk a little bit about noisy person cards and how it works and what it was designed to do? Yeah, sure. So noisy person cards is a, a game that I collaborated on with uh, Cat Cool that is a voice acting party game. It has very similar setup to like your apples to apples or your cards against humanity, mm -hmm. where 
a, a player will draw a character card and on that card will be something that you would see in a role playing game like a skeleton or a goblin or a vampire and everybody else around the table will have hands full of phrase cards and these will just be silly jokes essentially but the goal of the game is for the players uh, who have their phrase cards to read one of those phrase cards in the voice they think the character has. And the person who drew the character card will judge who did it best. And the theory behind the game is just to inundate people uh, with as many possibilities as possible uh, very quickly uh, to do different voices. Um, The commitment is not very long. You already know what to say because a sentence is already there written out for you. So really, it gives you a lot of time to engage with that creativity tool. And even people who are shy, who can't think of themselves doing it after a couple rounds in just because it's the game and it's what's expected in the game, they will eventually like warm up to it. And uh, one of the things that I added for like a more complex wrinkle to the game is there are also modifiers on voice cards uh, Mm. so that you can enhance a voice and like you're not just reading for a vampire, you're reading for a sexy vampire or you're reading for a aggressive vampire. Mm -hmm. A vampire who is a little bit sexy might uh, sound different than a vampire who is aggressive and angry. Those, those are two different characters and, you know, this game just uh, sort of challenges you. What does vampire mean to you? Mm-hmm. What does it mean if we change it? And all you have to do is read what's already written out for you. And because that's funny and silly, even if you do nothing, people are going to have a good time anyway because you're reading them a joke. Mm-hmm. So that's the basic setup of the game. That game got bought by Mattel. And they made their own version of it called Noisy Persons, which used to be sold exclusively in Toys R Us. I I don't know about the future of Mattel's version right now. Hmm. The only way to get your hands on the James and Cat version, which is a little bit different than the Mattel version, is really just through charity events that we do these days. Hmm. um, Raffles, like usually at a Catacon, we'll raffle off a couple copies every year. And then just the big theory behind it is practicing will help you learn how to pick up this skill um i wish noisy person cards was a thing that i could still distribute i can't because i legally don't own it anymore (laughs) um but you know people do have copies out there uh conventions i I, I try to make sure to donate copies to like different conventions game libraries and whatnot so Mm -hmm. people do have the opportunity to play if they want to play but you know mattel mattel has a version two and even though it doesn't have quite as many game jokes like the structure is still there Mm -hmm. of phrase cards and character cards so doing something like that to challenge yourself to like do stuff, you know, that, that, that helps you get your reps in, helps you practice, and hopefully helps you discover new voices that you didn't even know were in you. I have to say, we, I played it one time with a couple of friends, and I think it was like the Pirate Queen or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was one of my guy friends who was like a very deep voice. And so we were like, what is this voice? And he was like, well she's been smoking two packs a day for like 20 years and also like he had this like whole story about exactly why that was her voice and it was so good and like yeah that that, like that's another voice leads to character thing he Mm -hmm. did that voice and how is he justifying that voice this character is a smoker right Mm -hmm. um it it led to a backstory decision so already there you can see the synergy between voice and and character like world building nice yeah it's a lot of fun and it's um i I like adding the modifiers to things because it's i you can end up with some really weird ones. I feel like one of the cards is like a talking sword or something like that. Um, Which means so many different things. Right. It's it's like, I don't know what that is. You don't know what a talking sword sounds like? Oh, I don't. (laughs) Um, But it just is a fun exercise. And because the the phrases are, you know, like one or two sentences, you don't have to commit to something for very long too, which gives you the opportunity to try out a lot of like fun, different things that you wouldn't normally do when you have to like embody a full character all the mm-hmm. time. And uh, hey, if you want to practice noisy person card type thing at home, one thing that you can do is just get get a list of like basic character archetypes like princess, dragon, talking sword, magic mirror, uh, genie, that sort of thing. And just bring those up and see what you think they, how, how you think they talk. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, 
A talking sword could be like this, like Comet, the dancing blade. Very grandiose and and, uh, very strong and believes in a noble royal heritage. Or a talking sword could be like this. Just a silly talking sword. Very annoying. And both of those are totally valid reads and they're coming from the same person. And like, really, you can come at it from any angle and justify that's a talking sword. One of my favorite talking swords out there right now is on the Adventure Zone. I can't remember the sword's name, but he talks to Duck Newton a lot, and he's very annoying (laughs) and judgmental. And I I love that character and like, yeah, I could totally see a talking sword being like this. Let's practice once more. You're getting sloppy. Or the sort of dashing talking sword that works with uh, Starlight Surprise. It's just those base characters can lead you in so many different directions. And if you just start talking, you will surprise yourself Mm -hmm. um, and you will make new discoveries. So you can do that if you can't get your hands on the game. And I wish I could get the game into your hands. I really do. (laughs) Find a friend who has it. There are lots of us out there. Mm -hmm. Call me. Well, you can come over. I'm sad because I think I joined the like community of online role players and podcasters just a little too late. And I missed that getting on the ground floor of it. So, you know, and that's why it's so important to back my Kickstarters as soon as they come up. Dungeon Dome card game kickstarting in June. Really get on that mailing list. Don't be like Ryan. Don't be like Ryan. Don't miss it. Don't miss the sensation. <laughs> Would you have any other advice then for people that want to go ahead and give voices a try? Yeah, I actually did remember two techniques that I forgot <laughs> to mention earlier that I will just go uh, through really quickly. One is picture-based. Look through a monster manual, look at different character faces, and just try and talk like you think that character would talk. It's very similar to the noisy person cards approach, Mm -hmm. but having a visual key for what you think a character will sound like is actually going to be a good guide. If you notice a character has very big, thick cheeks, you might talk through his cheeks. Uh, If you're doing a code or something of that variety, maybe a Swiss person, you'll, you'll, you'll involve that, and, and that can be picture-led. Uh, the other thing, um, which is a little bit more advanced, um, sort of like spine work, is trying to move your voice around your face. So I could talk, you know, this is my default position. I am not self-conscious enough to think about where I talk from as a default, but I can move that voice down to my chin. And now I'm sort of trying to project my voice into my chin and it's doing a couple things to my mouth. It's making it a lot more firm. So I could see being a farmer, thinking about things that a farmer thinks about, just talking (laughs) into my chin, spitting occasionally. Or you can talk up into your nose, right? You can do the basic stormtrooper voice. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or nerdy stormtrooper, the nerdy, nerdy stormtrooper that uh, shows up on system mastery. Or the nerdy stormtrooper that shows up on campaign. Um, <laughs> or you can even uh, be up here with, with your no, uh, nose voice, be a bit of a scumbag, be a bit of a fast-talking huckster. <laughs> I'll be selling you snake oils and unctions and liniments and all sorts of things to make you feel better. Just eleven ninety five. step right up here. That's all <laughs> nasal-based. So exploring this nose, there's like thousands of characters just hiding in your nose. <laughs> um <laughs> So, like, moving that voice around, uh, one great bit of, like, accent uh, work voice, uh, like, advice that I've received is that an Irish person, Irish people talk like they're speaking two inches in front of their face. So you're really projecting those words out there, uh, trying to talk in front of your own face, which I, I, I think is really cool. So, and, and, like, that wasn't a perfect Irish accent, but <laughs> I... I uh, where you feel like like just pretending to position your voice in different places is going to lead you to new characters and whatnot. And that's a char- that's an exercise that might resonate with some people mm-hmm. and might confuse others, but but that's there. The last bit the last and most important bit of advice is just let yourself do it. Even if it's making you feel a little bit embarrassed and self conscious, let yourself try. And mm-hmm. even if even if you have to do it alone in your mirror you might be the only person that ever hears like the most pronounced version of the character voice that you're going to do. Um, and that's fine. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that really is fine. If you take a fraction of that back to the table, it just needs to be enough to change the way that you talk and you think of things to really summon up that character and bring them to life. So give yourself permission to try. Give yourself permission to fail. Um, and just like we say on campaign, acknowledge the failure, live in the failure, mm-hmm. and let the failure make you better. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much for sitting down with us, James. Thank you, guys. This was such a lovely discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that, that you're putting it out there. And, and uh, I, I love the character creation cast and the character evolution cast. Seems like it's also very my jam. <laughs> <laughs> so far, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Really, really handsome guests you've had on the show so far. <laughs> So can you remind everybody then uh, where they can find you online? So yeah, if you want to find me and my projects, uh, specifically actual place, so you can hear some of the wild voices that I've come up with on this show in action, you can go to oneshotpodcast.com. If you want to hear more about Bacta and like how he evolved as a character, check out the campaign podcast. It is our Star Wars Edge of the Empire show. It is very silly, very fun, and there's a lot of heart in it too. You can go to One Shot where... At this point, we've had 250 episodes. We've featured so many different game systems, and I've done so very many different voices on that show. So it is a listening treat because it's not just me doing voices. There are so many great, talented actors doing voices on that show uh, that you can listen to and, and learn stuff from. There are also shows like Neo Scum and Adventure uh, and Warda if you want uh, more actual play stuff. And then we've got lots of great great interview programs as well, like Backstory and Modifier and Talking Tabletop. Please, please come check out the One Shot Network. We'd love to have you there. If you want to talk to me and just ask me for like advice on game design or or uh, voice acting or what have you, you can hit me up at One Shot RPG on Twitter. That's the easiest place to, to catch me. And I try to respond to everything. Sometimes I miss things. So feel free to like at me a couple times <laughs> to get my attention. Uh, but I'd really love to hear from you. Wonderful. Oh, and also the Dungeon Gnome card game is coming out soon. Uh, Don't be like Ryan. Don't Don't miss it. (laughs) Don't miss it. Don't miss it. We're probably going to be kickstarting it mid-June. You can go to bit.ly slash Dungeon Dome. The Dungeon Dome is all lowercase there um, to sign up for the mailing list. Or you can follow me on Twitter. I'm going to be tweeting about it a lot when it drops. Yeah, we're really excited about it. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like Warda. Warda is an original fantasy actual play podcast created by Ali Grauer and Drew Marzieski. It's one part Game of Thrones, two parts Downton Abbey, served on the rocks with a twist of Agatha Christie. Discover magic, mystery, and more than a little sociopolitical commentary along the way. The city holds thousands of stories. What will yours be? Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within our show notes. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game systems used or today's guests can also be found in the show notes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time.